Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our uh, internet uh, slash uh, online radio podcast in which we go over all things um, relating to the Beatles, both in their history and um, and their present and their f- and their future, and uh, and as I said last week, some things in uh, in a totally different galaxy as we'll be uh, talking about in a, in a in a few moments. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beetle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my uh, three co-hosts. First, the uh, the host of the uh, syndicate and online uh, Beatles radio show, Ken Michaels. Hi, Ken. Hi, Al. Hi, everybody. And out on the uh, on the West Coast, the uh, the reporter for Beatles Examiner and a number of Examiner columns, uh, music, pop culture, you name it, he reports on it. Uh, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, uh, Al. Hello, everyone. And um, our resident musicologist, a longtime contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine, a very longtime uh, contributor and reviewer for uh, for the New York Times, mainly in the classical music uh, realm, and now doing uh, reviews and all kinds of other things for uh, the Wall Street Journal and various other publications, and that's uh, Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hey, Al. And being a stickler for detail, I thought I might mention that Ken's show is called Every Little Thing. You know, I I thought, wait a minute, I didn't say the name of the show. (laughs) Didn't say the name at all. And Ken. Thank you, Alan. But (laughs) anyway, so hi, Al. Hi, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) That's all correct, Al, all throughout the show. Good idea. Very Mm. good idea, which happens more and more as one gets a little older. (laughs) Yes, that happens on almost a daily basis. But it's also Uh, a voice of experience. Yeah, or something like that. (laughs) I thought I was the oldest one in here. No, I guess not. No, I've got you by (laughs) about three years. No, about two and a half years. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Ken's still the baby of the group. Ken's still the baby of the group, right? I'm the George of the group. Yes. <laughs> but I'm not what? the quiet one. Yes. <laughs> yes, hardly. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> this is great. Let's do it. All right. But that's what we got to do. That's going to be our, our, be our topic one week. Which beetle we are. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Actually, that that's, right. that's actually a good topic. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to a never mind. Go ahead, Al. Uh, well, let's see. But bring you back to uh, some sense of decorum before we get into our uh, our topic, which will be actually is a continuation of our kind of our sort of fantasy show uh, from last week. Speaking on the realm of fantasy, uh, there was uh, a lot of conversation this week regarding a set of 78 RPM discs. And uh, as our resident collector and uh, uh, expert on auctions and things like that, Steve can uh, kind of uh, fill us in on that. Well, we're actually only talking about one disc, uh, ah. Omega Omega Auctions in the UK is auctioning off a 78 RPM disc, a sing, a, it's just a single disc, like I said. One side of the disc has Hello Little Girl, uh, and the other side has Till There Was You. And the interesting thing is the uh, writing on the disc was done by Brian Epstein, and Brian, number one, wrote the title of uh, Hello Little Girl as H-U-L-L-O, Hello. But he also, he also on both sides, he, on the Hello Little Girl, which was sung by John Lennon, he wrote John Lennon and the Beatles. Until There Was You, he wrote Paul McCartney and the Beatles. And um, on the Hello Little Gir- Girl side, he wrote at the bottom, he wrote Lennon, comma, McCartney huh. uh, to, to distinguish the fact that, you know, one of the songs was written by John and Paul and the other one wasn't. But the, uh, you know, as often happens with these things that get auctioned, you know, so many things, so many times you hear the words Holy Grail described as, you know, um, as, you know, these things being some kind of a Holy Grail thing in regard to the Beatles. And in this case, you know, you can't uh, deny 
the fact that this this disc is historical because it was used by Brian and was given to George, uh, uh, George Martin uh, for the uh, you know to get to him to look at the group. The tracks, however, are not one-offs. They were the Decca edition tracks, mm-hmm. which have been which Hello Little Girl was on Anthology One. Until There Was You was was bootlegged. So just about everybody listening to the show has heard those songs and i mean i you know there's no denying that the that, like i said that the, the disc is historical it is and it would be great to have it in a you know in a museum or maybe uh uh sir paul will uh, go for this himself for historic reasons i don't know or you know what's funny is that they're only expecting they're only estimating it's going to sell for ten thousand pounds, which I think is way low. That's thirteen thousand, about almost fourteen thousand dollars. Yeah, it's sort of a uh, cheap grail as grails go. Yeah, yeah. It'll of be course. the one that the French guy in the in the castle in Monty Python's Holy Grail has. You right. know, right. we've already got one. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about it, though, is the mm-hmm. provenance of it. Um, you know, it was owned by uh, the keyboard player for Jerry and the Pacemakers, right? Who mm-hmm. covered "Hello, Little Girl." So, you know, we can clearly see what happened. You know, George Martin had the disc; he gave it to the group to learn the song. You know, and also on the, the labels of these discs say that you know they were cut at the HMV shop, and so that's also part of the you know, Beatles story, as we've mm-hmm. heard it told a gazillion times that Brian sure. took the audition tapes, went to the HMV shop and and had them cut into discs. I don't okay. think anyone has ever seen these discs before. I mean, I've never seen a picture of them. So now mm-hmm. now we have a picture of those two sides, which is which is a nice thing, I think. I love I love the part on the on the label. It says public performance prohibited without license, <laughs> and it and it also says made with high fidelity recording recording equipment. Yeah, but not from the snippet we've heard. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, the the snippet they, they the BBC played it, and in fact, there's a video of, of it out there, which I blogged the other day. Which is way too fast, and but if you slow it down, it's definitely the Decca Editions tape. But it's still, yeah, it's. But it, actually, it sounds nice with the asset with the little crackles there. I think actually, you know, that sounds pretty cool. Of course, who is it that that calls things like this the Holy Grail? Auction houses. They they do that all the time. Really? I mean, they're always, yeah. Oh yeah. The, they always oversell these things. I mean, I've written up. You know, auditions not only by the, for the Beatles stuff, mm-hmm. but for you know Elvis and you know all sorts of things. And there's a lot of that term Holy Grail gets bounced around a lot, and you just kind of have to ignore it. You know, mm. it's just you know go past it and look at go look at exactly what is being sold. And in, you know, in this case, like I said, there's no denying the historical value of this disc, but the songs themselves have been around. I, I, I wrote about. Uh, an acetate a couple of years ago that uh, had an unknown version, previously unknown version of what goes on that wasn't even sung by Ringo oh. that I think it was sung by, by John. And I had people writing to me going, please don't write about this. We want to, we want to buy it so we can do something. <laughs> yeah. with it. And, and I, you know, it only sold, I looked it up the other day. It didn't sell for that much. So where, it, but it's disappeared, whatever's happened to it. God only knows. Mm-hmm. So, so as far as we know, there were acetates made of all 15 songs for the Decca recordings. Do we know that for a fact? That's always been the story over the years, and I don't think uh, I don't think Mark Lewison debunked Alan, that. Debunked that. Alan, Alan, you were talking about that. Is that? I mean, I I don't recall reading that. I mean, I you... don't remember you know seeing that detail, but you know it, it's always been spoken of more vaguely. Like he had this. He had the audition tape. He went and had it cut into discs. Um, whether mm-hmm. it was all of them or not, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, if this, in, in, unless there was a performance that they all particularly disliked and asked him not to cut, uh, I don't see why he wouldn't have cut them all, really. It mm. makes sense, though, though, that he would have, because, you know, for reference sake, for, you know, for his, I mean, because at that point he was, you know, he, he didn't know who was going to sign them. So it, it, it does kind of make sense that, you know, I mean, it, it, if you were managing the Beatles at that point, wouldn't you make copies of all, of, you know, 
uh, of all those songs. I, I mean, I think I would, especially yeah. since that or was maybe all... I would. I would have made copies of what I thought were the best ones. Mm. That would help mm. really sell them. Well, yeah, but I mean, the, the fact that the whole tape was, you know, that uh, was available, uh, that I mean, the other songs were not tossed because they had, they surfaced, you know, later. There weren't any others from the Decca auditions that didn't get used. I mean, they didn't get right. So, uh, yeah, I, I I mean, I would think that he made copies of everything. That, yeah, and especially since stylistically the songs were all over the place, you know, musically, he mm-hmm. may have uh, decided, well, let's, you know, let's try to see what we can sell to which record company. Mm-hmm. 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 And, of course, the publishing arm of EMI was interested, according to Mark, with Light yes. Dreamers Zoo. So right. there must have been an acetate for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, anyway, this thing will be sold on March 22nd, and it'll be interesting to see what it goes for. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, mm. But definitely it, not, a, uh, not a Holy Grail. No. Or at least not a, not a Monty Python Holy Grail. Yes. <laughs> Very true. For it, Very for it to true. be a, a, a holy yep. grail, it has to be something that's really sought after. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. You know, so the, the term is just being misused. But this is what's happened to English these days, anyway. So yes, you know. indeed, it's all these all these young young uh, youngins in the uh, newspaper business. Right, right. As, as Alan keeps saying, you know, now the twelve-year-olds yeah. are running newspapers. <laughs> you know, and the BBC apparently, and the BBC. Right. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, it's funny because we we saw this article, this written about a lot on the Internet and, you know, Steve wrote about it and pretty much everyone said, well, it's a bit of a stretch to call it the Holy Grail. But yes, on the BBC, it was the Holy Grail. You know, I mean, they now, just were... I, saw, I saw that Holy Grail link passed around an awful lot and I didn't see a lot of people. And in fact, there were people that should have known better that were passing it around as Holy Grail. So, I mean, I that I mean, I, you know, if you pass around links and you don't explain them or you don't you know and that's what you source out as news right you know that's that's what happens and and that did happen in this case yeah so as so yeah. often happens these days yeah i sent the link to my old editor at the times because they still you know have the the short reports and 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 he sometimes will send me something saying is this something and he hadn't sent me this one so i thought i would send it down to them and say you know this actually is significant but i wouldn't say holy grail you know i mean no. I sort of warned them off that but you know but said why it was significant because of you know its place in the story and the fact that jerry and the pacemakers keyboard player had it and right you know so nice piece yeah. not holy grail Right. You could you could have sent him my link, Alan. Um, yours wasn't up yet. I don't think it was, oh, okay. it was very early New York time. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. The, the interesting thing, though, about Les McGuire having it was uh, somebody actually asked me, well, why did Les McGuire have it? I mean, that's kind of a – that is actually an interesting question. Mm-hmm. I mean, outside of the, the fact that obviously, you know, there's the Brian Epstein connection between Jerry and the Pacemakers and the Beatles. Sure. It is interesting that Les McGuire did have it and why Brian gave it to him. Because they learned uh, the song, because they recorded the song. Yeah, that's true. Oh, okay. And it could be that George Martin gave it. You know, it could be that Brian had given it to George Martin and George Martin gave it to, to the pacemakers. And it's, you know, we don't know the, totally what the story is, but, but there is I, I, a, a lot of links there. No, he yeah. says McGuire says he was given it by Epstein. By Epstein, okay. Yeah, it's possible so, that you know each member of the group had gotten a demo, and uh, well, you know, Freddie Marsden is gone, and uh, we don't know where <laughs> Les Chadwick uh, hasn't really emerged in a long time, and uh, I don't know if Jerry would st- still has still has his. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? So. It's uh, it's very interesting, but uh, but definitely not a not a holy grail. So why don't we uh, go on to our uh, to the uh, the main event? This is a continuation of uh, as uh, as it was labeled uh, uh, our our fantasy show from from last week, in which what we did was we we decided to do some some speculating and fantasizing in a sense of. 
people that we would like to see, people alive or dead from basically any any time, you know, not necessarily contemporaneous of any of the Beatles, that we would like to have seen them work with in their in their post Beatles career, uh, either as collaborators, as per, perhaps songwriting partners, perhaps producers whatever and we covered uh john lennon paul mccartney excuse me john lennon george harrison and uh and ringo star last week now comes the tough part mm. and that is the uh the, the 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 ever unpredictable paul mccartney and um uh, I'll uh, I'll throw myself into the fray as I did last week, and uh, I've got a short list of people that I would like to see Paul either have worked with or perhaps still might. It's it's conceivable. We'll we'll see. Uh, one of them is uh, a. a <laughs> not not a choice that one would uh, uh, probably associate with Paul uh, as a collaborator and that's Todd Rundgren. Oof. Um, mm. I've always felt that, that in a sense they, that they, that Paul and Todd have a lot of the same va- musical values. Plus the fact that they also seem to have this, this hunger to get into new technologies. Obviously, just recently we have uh, the situation with Paul having um, done a series of musical uh, emoticons for uh, for Skype, and Todd does all kinds of things in all kinds of different uh, different ki- different modes of media. Uh, and and so I've, I've, I, I kind of feel that it would be very interesting to see the the two of them work together either as collaborators or possibly a situation with uh, maybe Todd producing Paul, but in some in some fashion I'd like to see them uh, I'd like to see them work together. Uh, second one, it's maybe even more unpredictable, and that would be Billy Joe Armstrong. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with uh, music of the last 25 years, uh, <laughs> Billy Joe Armstrong was the is the the, the primary uh, musical force behind the group Green Day, and also was the primary musical force behind the Broadway show American Idiot, which was based on an album by Green Day, and. Um, Again, I've always kind of felt that the two that he and Paul have some some of the same musical influences. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, obviously Green Day is is much harder edged than most of what uh, what Paul does. But then again, Paul recently worked with the surviving members of Nirvana. So it's not as if he's averse to working with uh, people that come out of the quote quote alt, you know grunge era or alternative rock. Uh, so I think it would be very interesting to see Paul and Billy Ar- Billy Joe Armstrong work together. The third one, and <clears throat> this is a real fantasy one, and Ken is really not going to agree with this one. <laughs> I would like to have seen Paul work with Elvis Presley, but not the Elvis of the 50s or of the 60s. I would have liked to see uh, uh, Paul work with the Elvis of the 70s. Why would you think I disagree with that? Well, you're... (laughs) Why? I mean, we talked about Elvis in a previous show, and I love his 70s music. You love his 70s music. A lot of us don't. A lot of us don't. A lot of us feel that uh, especially coming off of the the '68 comeback special, and from Elvis in Memphis, that he was and the, the beginning of his you know his coming out as a live performer once again. Uh, one would have felt that he was sort of setting up a great third act to his career, 
and then with uh, you know the Memphis Mafia and Dr. Nick feeding him drugs up the wazoo and with Colonel Parker basically doing nothing but counting the money and uh, mandating that he just uh, you know continue to play Vegas and go on tour and everything um, his um, the quality of his of his records like uh, very similar to what happened in the 60s went down the tubes and which i know you disagree with ken look but, i like uh, so, all of it you know so i'm when, not as super critical of, of elvis the way that you are there but the singles that he put well, out and I'm, and late I'm 60s saying, and 70s and and i I'm thought saying, were very strong i'm saying this as an elvis fan i okay. you know i'm a i'm a a great fan of his his better material but the problem is that he wasted so much of his career. And so I would have loved to have seen back in the 70s when Paul was still doing some production work, you know, the McGear album, working with Rod Stewart, etc. I would love to have seen Paul in the studio with Elvis with, you know, no restrictions from, uh, you know, no restrictions from Colonel Parker with a with Elvis straight as a string, you know, no, uh, you know, not hopped up on pills or anything else. I would have loved to have seen what what possibly Paul might have done with Elvis as a, you know, as a, a collaborator or producer. It would have been it would have been very interesting. I, I have to say, as an Elvis fan myself, that uh, I think that's an interesting thought. I, I, there are probably better people that you could have gotten to work with Elvis than than Paul. Um, mm-hmm. Sure. More more distinctive, you know. I mean, I love that that '70s period myself. Mm. That uh, that Hawaii concert, I, I I think is wonderful. I really do. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, it that would have been interesting to to see. Especially if they performed together uh, in those days, you know. Can you imagine? Can you? I mean, here's a crazy thought: Elvis in wings. Can you imagine that? No, <laughs> that would be tougher. That would be tougher. Yeah, that's. <laughs> they could have made a Christmas album. There we go. <laughs> that I would have loved. That that makes sense actually. But Al, I actually have Elvis as one of my many choices here. So, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with most of what you just said there. It's just that I like so many songs from all the different periods of Elvis's career. I don't just knock the seventies totally. There's a lot of great stuff oh, that yeah. he did as singles. Well, there, so, there is, you know, you can... there is, there is some, some of his singles from the seventies are good, but an awful lot of it is, is, you know, it's basically just the same careless crap that he was turning out in through much of the sixties. You know, which is the, the that's the sad thing about his his career. He was, you know, because he only had a 23 year 23 year career. And unfortunately, about, uh, oh, probably 18 or 19 of those years were were wasted on crappy movies and crappy records and and uh, concerts where he was zonked out on drugs and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and crummy records. So, you know, it would have been nice if, uh, you know, if Colonel Parker had been proactive enough to, you know, kind of, you know, just basically just stop counting the money and, uh, you know, have some, you know, take some care for his client and, you know, have him work with uh, with some contemporary uh, producers, you know, uh, and certainly somebody producers, collaborators, whatever, and certainly somebody like Paul would have been a, a great feather in his cap, but mm-hmm. that's the way and, it goes. And given, given the respect that Paul has for Elvis, it, it would have oh, been of course. He would you know, have been, natural. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, because, I mean, Paul has, is, a, uh, by his own admission, is an Elvis disciple. No question. Considering all... how much he loved the 50s Elvis, he probably would have turned it more into a 50s feel. Probably Elvis. because he he has said that basically he you know he really you know kind of went off Elvis by the early sixties you know mm-hmm. the post the post army Elvis. But he owns a number of instruments that Elvis was associated with you know yes. just in his own collection right. too. Yes. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a, like three honorable mention um, choices, and they're more more predictable. I think each of us has mentioned Carl Perkins in uh, mm-hmm. in respect to you know uh, one or more Beatle, and certainly. I would lo- have loved to have seen uh, Paul do more than the, you know, the one track that was uh, the one or two tracks that have been released uh, of him with Carl. It would have been really nice to see them do an entire album together. Mm. The uh, let's see. Uh, oh, the next one is perhaps even more predictable because these two were born the same week. Uh, Brian Wilson was born two days after Paul, mm-hmm. and uh, and I've always said I you know I absolutely defy anyone to give me the names of of two musical composers, and I'll even and Alan I'll even take classical uh, composers, <laughs> uh, two that were born in the same week that have mm. had the kind of impact on on the musical world that uh, that Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson have had. And uh, and you, you can tell when when they're together that there's a you know that there's a kind of a, a special bond. I think they kind of realize that even though they were born in you know two very different parts of the world, the fact that they were born two days apart, that there is a you know there is a kind of a special bond there. You know they're kind of like brothers from different mothers. And so mm-hmm. I would uh, I would love to see, and of course, at least in this case, it still can happen. I uh, would love to see Paul and Brian do more than you know just the odd track here and there on you know one of Brian's albums. You know, do an entire project together. And the last one is a uh, is a curveball, as we you know we know that Paul has uh, <laughs> over the years sometimes had difficulty with producers. Because of the fact that, you know, let's face it, he, you know, he has an artist temperament and he has his own way of uh, wanting his records made and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and so sometimes has had uh, has clashed with producers. Uh, George Martin was a, obviously an exception because I guess because of the fact that they had so much history together. They were able to to mesh well as um, you know as producer and artist even you know in the uh, in in the solo years, but one art, one producer that especially you know given that Paul has uh, uh, you know again has a fondness for uh, for you know contemporary music and and things that are more than just you know just more than just rock and roll that he's you know his influences musically are are very wide ranging i think if paul went into the studio with quincy jones mm-hmm. i okay. think they could i think they could make magic together you know in a in a musical sense um, I think it would be. I think it would, that would be a, a match made in heaven because knowing that um, again, uh, Quincy's own resume is so wide ranging mm-hmm. and 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 so large. Uh, you know, I think he has the you know the gravitas that. You know, let's see. Let's face it. This is the man who, at the you know the We Are the World session, you know the the said you know uh, leave your leave your ego at the door, and perhaps he would uh, he he might be able to have Paul do the same thing. So I would I would love to see Quincy Jones work with uh, work with Paul in a producer artist uh, environment. I love that suggestion. I think that's fantastic. Oh, I thanks. think all your suggestions are really interesting. Ah, thanks. Appreciate it. So those are my suggestions. Now, how about Ken? All right. You want my top three first, or you want all the honorable mentions? Because I've got plenty you, of them. Whatever you got. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me do my top three, but i got to tell you, for the number three, I got three artists who were all tied, and I really had a tough time picking which one ranked the highest. I put Burt Bacharach in there. Because Burt Bacharach, mm-hmm. to me, is one of the greatest songwriters of all time. He's a master of melody. He's done so many great things. 
in terms of uh, melody arrangements, very odd, odd melodies and odd uh, chord changes and and intervals and and he's known so much for that and paul has done a lot of that on his own too Mm -hmm. but just like elvis costello worked with burt backer i'd like to see what would happen if the two of them worked together um Mm -hmm. i think that it would stretch paul creatively a bit more and both uh, you know it it would be a mutual uh, thing they would both stretch creatively i think from that even though you know burt backerack is now in his 80s and and paul is 73 Mm -hmm. You know, it would be right. challenging to to work with someone who's that innovative when it comes to writing songs, and uh, you know that's that's someone who I, I think Burt Bacharach is you know one of the top songwriters ever. When mm-hmm. you take a look at um, all the people that he's written with, especially Hal David, another person that I put on the list is someone that I'm shocked that Paul has never worked seriously with, considering his whole history with uh, the Beatles, and that's James Taylor. And because of the fact that he started on Apple and they've been friends for many years, and I know Paul was on the Apple album playing bass Mm -hmm. on Caroline in my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was also on the Walking Man album just to do backing vocals on one track. But the two of them would really sound natural together on acoustic guitars. Their vocals would blend so well. James Taylor, just like Paul, is great at harmonies. Um, I can easily hear so many great acoustic songs between the two of them together. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, you're going to hear me use the word natural a lot, and I think the two of them would be a natural pair. Also, I had to put Jeff Lynne in there. You know, Jeff Lynne worked with Paul on Flaming Pie, as well as with the Beatle tracks. But um, Jeff never wrote a song with Paul McCartney. And I think his gift for melody... Obviously, so many of his songs are very Beatlesque, and um, I think that not everything would sound like ELO because ELO, like John Lennon said, took off where I Am the Walrus left off. Mm-hmm. Um, not everything would be orchestrated if Jeff Lennon and Paul were together, but I think there's such admiration between the two of them. I always look back uh, a year or two when, when uh, Jeff Lynn was on the Grammys. Yes. And Paul's in the audience singing along right. with Evil Woman. And, you know, you know, why aren't the two of them together? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. I mean, yes, they worked on Flaming Pie. And Jeff added a lot as a musician in there, played a lot of different instruments. But the two of them never wrote anything together. I'd love to see the two of them uh, as songwriters and doing, you know, a full album together, what that would sound like. Second on my list has to be Barry Gibb. Mm. And the reason why I put Barry Gibb in there is because I have such respect for the work of the Bee Gees, what all the brothers wrote. And apart from the great songs that the Bee Gees recorded for themselves, one of the things that Barry Gibb has in common with Paul, with all these people practically, Burt Bacharach Mm -hmm. and Jeff Lynne, is that they also wrote great material for other people. Right. You know, and and Barry Gibb, I always loved the work he did with with Barbara Streisand in particular Mm -hmm. on the Guilty album, Dionne Warwick, Riding Islands in the Stream for Kenny Rogers Mm -hmm. and Sally Parton, all those songs, of course, for for Andy. Um, You know, there's so much great stuff that Barry Gibb has written with his brothers, and he is also a great melody writer. And this is at a time, it's it's so sad that he's the only brother left. And maybe... Mm -hmm. Maybe he's looking for someone. Um, mm-hmm. Who knows? Who knows how much drive he still has left? But, um, you know, I think that they're just such great songwriters, great mo- melody writers. I think the two of them could work very well together. Um, so my second choice there was Barry Gibb. We were lucky enough to see Barry last year when he did that limited tour. He did mm. it in the, in the Bay Area. It was awesome. I'll, I mean, we saw the Bee Gees one tour too. And that was, that was much better than I ever expected. My wife's the big fan. I mean, she loved Robin Gibb to the hill and Mm -hmm. we went, we went to that and, and I was absolutely floored by that show and Barry's was, was good too. But did you know that there are a bunch of Barry Gibb demos on iTunes that you can, you can, and they're not, 
really expensive. I mean, he has, I think, three collections. But uh, I think Guilty is one of them, you know, the song you do with Streisand. Mm-hmm. But uh, those, you know, you might want to check those out, Ken. They're, they're interesting. I have, I have them. Uh, okay. They're... But I, I just have this, this great admiration for people who can write for other people because that mm-hmm. takes a whole other talent altogether. Mm-hmm. Sure. And then there's all the other stuff the Bee Gees wrote that were hits from Saturday Night Fever for other people. So Barry Gibb is my number two choice. And, of course, the Bee Gees heavily influenced by the Beatles right there. Sure. Of course. Uh, number one is, is so easy. I don't even have to think about it. And that's Stevie Wonder. And even though Paul worked with Stevie on Ebony and Ivory and What's That You're Doing on Tug of War, I'd like to see them seriously make a whole album together, write the songs mm-hmm. together from scratch, make them close to 50-50 collaborations. They're both so innovative the two of them, as musicians and as songwriters, they both can play every instrument that you need (laughs) on the recordings. They've made albums where they play all the instruments. There's so many similarities there between Paul and Stevie Wonder, and Stevie's also one of the greatest melodic songwriters ever, and also very versatile, very eclectic musically. I could see Paul singing along with a, a Stevie Wonder ballad. I could see Paul singing along with a reggae song that Stevie Wonder wrote. You know, the two of them would be so natural together. And I know they have so much respect for each other. I just don't know why the two of them never, you know, sat down. If they spent a couple of months together in the studio, can you imagine what those two minds would come up with together? Uh, You know, a whole album of Paul and Stevie Wonder, I could go for that. You know, I don't think anybody was more excited to hear that those two were working together when I heard about Ebony and Ivory. And I love that song. You know, mm-hmm. But still, they didn't write it together, and they sound great together vocally. And um, you know, I just think the world of both of them as musicians and as songwriters. And Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder can play every instrument just like Paul. You should check out online how great a drummer Stevie Wonder is. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. it's not the thing that you see normally because you used to seeing him, you know, playing the keyboards in in most cases. So um, yeah, Paul and Stevie are just an absolute natural. So I'll very quickly run down the list of honorable mentions with a quick comment for each because mm-hmm. Paul is so versatile that I could see him working with just about anybody. Sure. There are very few people that I would say no to here. But um, the Everly Brothers, certainly if Phil was still alive, you could say that about John, Paul, and George because mm-hmm. just like I said about George Harrison and Paul Simon together, you know, they're great harmony singers. And I loved when Paul wrote On the Wings of a Nightingale for the Everly Brothers. It was the perfect song for the Everlys. You know, imagine if Paul had sung with the two of them or to work with just Don now. Yeah. Um, Billy Joel, definitely. I hear so much of McCartney and Billy Joel's music. Strong melodic writer. I can definitely hear the two of them connecting. Eric Carmen. Definitely. There's so many songs that Eric has done that I hear a McCartney influence in particular. Yeah, I, 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 Eric Harmon would love to work with McCartney. Yeah, definitely. Elvis Presley was on my list. Brian Wilson was on my list, especially when Brian was close to full capacity, shall yeah. we say. Sure. Um, you know, the two of them would have been incredible together, but I'd still love to see them now. Yeah. Um, they did make a duet together mm-hmm. a few albums back from right. from, uh, from Brian. Uh, mm-hmm. A friend like you, and they sounded great on that song. The Finn brothers, uh, Neil and Tim, known for being in in uh, Crowded House. Uh, there's, you know, I'll, they're a group that we didn't mention in the Beatles show. We should have. Um, yeah. A lot of a lot of songs from them sound very Beatlesy, and I can easily hear Paul writing with them. Same thing with the Squeeze guys. You know, Chris Difford and Glenn Tilbrook. Gilbert O'Sullivan. <laughs> There's someone we didn't mention before, but hmm. you tell me when Claire came out and Alone Again Naturally, it didn't remind you of Paul McCartney. Come on. <laughs> Except um, where on earth is is Gilbert O'Sullivan today? He's still recording and he's still touring. Really? But he has, yeah, yeah, he's still alive. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, he doesn't. I think he has a big following, certainly in England, but I think in Japan. There's always talk that he might come here as part of a 70s uh, you know, group of artists in a package show, but that that hasn't happened. But mm-hmm. um, get down is <laughs> very yeah. important. Ray Charles, I would have loved Paul with Ray Charles. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly one of my biggest idols, Carol King. I mean, there is to me probably the greatest female pop songwriter of all time, in my opinion. 
She's written so many great hits. Great melodic writer. Would love to see Paul and Carol King together. Uh, Chrissy Hind. There's a band that's very Beatles influenced. Chrissy has the coolest female voice in rock to me. And of course, she was, she's friends with Paul, was friends sure. with Linda. Uh, right. little, little Richard. Who wouldn't want to see Paul with Little Richard? It's like John with Chuck Berry. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a perfect pairing of a 50s rocker. Imagine if the two of them were together and they wrote 50 style songs, much like what Paul did on Run, Devil, Run. And, um, you know, the two of them sang together with those screaming vocals, wrote original except, songs, except what? Except that you probably want a younger Little Richard. Not, oh, sure. Not Richard now. Right. You know. Right. Can I mention something really quick? Um, Gilbert O'Sullivan has just released a single, and he is on tour in England as we speak. In fact, he's playing Birmingham tonight as we're taping. Uh, uh, or today, he was playing Birmingham today. Oh, okay. There and you and go. he plays. And if so, and if I could ask one question about uh, of one of one of the names on your list, Eric uh-huh. Carmen. Yeah. Um, do you think maybe in a sense? Eric is a little, maybe a little too McCartney-esque, you know, that's the, possible, that, sure. you'd, that you'd have basically two Paul McCartneys, you know, rather than Paul McCartney and then someone to kind of musically counterbalance against. It's it's possible. Yeah. I'm just thinking in terms of what they would come up with melodically. I don't mm. care if Eric's very close to Paul. I just think, you know, if you like both their their music both of them, that they would blend well together. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about songs like All By Myself, mm-hmm. um, Sunrise on the first uh, oh, yeah. Eric, Eric uh, Carmenel, Great Expectations, which is right out of the McCartney playbook. You know, if, if they work well together, fine. You know, you do want to have contrast, but sometimes if you have two people that, are, that sound similar, it could still work just as well. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it'll be as interesting, <laughs> But, you know, I can hear those two together. Okay. And I think you had a couple more names. Yeah, real quick. More with Dave Grohl. Definitely. I love Dave Grohl sure. with Paul McCartney. Brings out the real edge in Paul. I'd love to hear more of that. Um, Smokey Robinson, considering, you know, how much sure. the Beatles admire him. Vocally, the two of them would sound great together. Several years ago, Paul was on WPLJ in New York, and he was asked a question, if there's anyone you haven't worked with yet, who would you like it to be? And I was kind of surprised that he mentioned this name because it's one of my favorite singers, and that's Gladys Knight. I'd love to hear the two of them. I mean, obviously, that would be strictly mm. a vocal thing. Sure. Um, and because of the fact that we've had this bootleg for so long, Paul and Donovan sounded great together. I don't know why they mm. didn't really seriously work together, you know, especially kind of like with James Taylor, a, an acoustic album with those two. And mm. when you listen to something like Lalania, Tell me that isn't, you know, a lot like yesterday right there. It didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't remind you somewhat of that. Um, I could easily hear Paul with David Bowie. Strange thing. I could hear him with Bowie, but not with Elton John. <laughs> I just hmm. I see the two of them challenging each other a lot. And when you, when you hear so much of what David, all the progressions that he, that he made in his music, all the different types of production, the Brian Eno stuff, you know, I could, I could hear Paul getting into that. And more with Michael Jackson, because I think they sounded so great together. I think that, uh, you know, they both admired each other. I could say that about all these people, really. But I also think in my head, Paul is so great at singing with other people. He has a way of blending vocally with just about everybody. And he sounded great with Michael, just like he did with Stevie Wonder. I would Mm -hmm. have loved to have seen more with the two of them. Of course, this was, you know, if they had not fallen out over the over the whole uh, publishing issue. Yeah. But those are, those are the ones that came up with plenty of them. <laughs> uh, plenty of them. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> indeed. All right. Let's turn to Mr. Cozen and see uh, what very interesting uh, nominees uh, he, he'll have. Well, I'm going to be the antidote to that. I, I don't have yes. people that I <laughs> wouldn't want to hear him with. Um, <laughs> and in fact, I mean, I would just soon erase the Michael Jackson collaboration. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even crazy about the Stevie Wonder ones, but they're better than the Michael Jackson ones. In terms of people who he has worked with, who I wish he worked with more, 
that one is for me pretty obvious, which is Elvis Costello. I really thought the two of them wrote a bunch of really great songs that were on each other's albums. Um, they actually did enough songs to have made an album together. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but you have to collect them from, you know, B sides and albums of each of them and, you know, and then figure out what kind of track sequence you'd like to do, which is, is sort of a game that I know a bunch of people have played, you know, to make the Elvis McCartney album in, in a way that makes sense. But, you know, My Brave Face, I thought was just a brilliant song. And pretty much all of the ones, there, there were ones I liked more than others in the group they came up with, but... Um, uh, I, I just thought it was a great bunch of songs. And mm -hmm. uh, what I'd like to have heard is them produce those songs or a bunch of other songs together, you know, playing the instruments, sharing the vocals, splitting the mm -hmm. vocals, whatever, but make an album together, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and possibly go in different directions because, you know, they're both interested in a whole lot of different kinds of music these days. I mean, they've both done classical pieces. Um, Elvis Costello has, as I think uh, Ken said, was it Ken or Al, I don't, about Burt Bacharach? Mm -hmm. mm. I think it was Ken. Um, you know, they've both worked, Elvis has worked with Burt Bacharach, and I think that, uh, you know, that was a, a, a good collaboration idea, you know, for Paul too. And, you know, but Elvis has done sort of semi-jazz things with Bill Frizzell. I think that, you know, Paul and Elvis have such broad interests in a lot of different kinds of music that given unlimited studio time and, uh, you know, time to work out some ideas together, I think they could make a brilliant album. When we first started talking about this idea, you know, weeks and weeks ago, we were talking about, you know, this rumor is it's more than a rumor i think there's correspondence about it but it never happened um but there was supposed to be someone was trying to set up a collaboration between miles davis paul mccartney and mm. jimi hendrix mm -hmm. um that yeah you know who knows it's really hard to tell you know you would think that for instance a collaboration between jimi hendrix and john mclaughlin would be incredible and they did one and there are tapes of it and they're awful um so who knows this might not have been any good but if you're talking about mccartney as a bass player miles and hendrix i mean we're talking about three supreme virtuosos on their instruments if the the, the cards had you know fallen in the right way and it, it, on the right day, maybe they could have made some incredible music, um, mm -hmm. unlike anything we'd have heard before. Mm -hmm. um, and along those lines, this is a little in left field, but I'm thinking of someone who is, like McCartney, a supremely innovative bassist, but also a brilliant multi-instrumentalist and really interesting songwriter. And that would be Jack Bruce. I kind of would mm -hmm. like to hear a collaboration between the two of them. Just, you know, putting something together that isn't quite what either of them has done. And uh, obviously, you know, it's not going to happen. But but I, I think that would have been a, a nice thing to have happened. I mean, Jack Bruce worked with Ringo, too. So close to that, but maybe not quite close enough. Um, mm -hmm. And so my last one is Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead. Johnny Greenwood, like Paul, also has done classical music, but he's done more out-on-the-edge, avant-garde classical music than mm. Paul has. When Paul's done classical things, they've always been kind of timid in a way. I mean, he's done mm. some beautiful, beautiful stuff, but it's really stuff from decades and decades ago. You know, um, the the last piece that he wrote for Linda, the, the Latin one, was um, Echo Cormeum, I think it mm -hmm. was called. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was basically a turn of the 19th, 20th century Victorian English piece. And so he's, you know, he's really good at listening to a style and mastering it and, you know, coming up with something that's going to work. Um, and I liked Liverpool Oratorio because it was, you know, it was basically song forms, elongated song forms, and song forms mm -hmm. are something he can do. Um, and there was some beautiful stuff in it and, and all around. But 
what's always bothered me about his classical pieces is that he was the one who was bringing in the tape loops when they were doing Revolver. He was the one who was listening to Luciano Berrio. He was the one who was giving interviews where he mentioned Stockhausen and, you know, Cassandra Younglinger, which was one of his, you know, incredible electronic music pieces. And I kind of always felt that when Paul did classical music, it should be up to the minute classical music, not 19th, early 20th century classical music. Johnny Greenwood is doing that. So I kind of think that if the two of them were to collaborate on a classical project or a rock project, you know, because he's sort of out on the edge of rock music too. And mm. uh, I, I really kind of think that, you know, again, as with Jack Bruce, as with Elvis Costello, here are a couple of guys who are interested in a whole lot of different kinds of music and are very, very inventive people and left to their own devices could probably come up with something really different, you know, that, that we haven't heard before from either side of the collaboration. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I was looking for when I was, was piecing these, these, these collaborations together. And so I don't have that many of them. I'm mean, going to agree that, that Paul and Brian Wilson would be really interesting and, and a lot of other, you know, of the ones that Ken mentioned and, and Al. Um, but I just wanted to focus on these ones that would sort of push the envelope a bit. Yeah. And of and and of course we you know Paul has a history of kind of musically pushing the envelope with you know the firemen with mm -hmm. the Liverpool sound collage right et cetera right. et cetera yeah mm -hmm. that's true I Paul is is a fan of Radiohead I've heard that's right well and he he didn't he um, pinch one of he the, worked with the Nigel producers. Godrich yeah right yeah right. So, so I don't know. I think I thought, that would be interesting. I thought that I heard that he he asked Tom York from Radiohead to collaborate with him, but he turned him down. Hmm. Somebody turned him down. It's possible. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. I think because I think he asked the wrong guy. He should have asked Johnny Greenwood. <laughs> <laughs> to me, Johnny Greenwood is the more interesting musician. You know, Tom Tom York is the front guy, but. Mm. He's too busy whining. Johnny Greenwood's doing the music. <laughs> That's okay. just my opinion. <laughs> just curious, uh, what did you have against Paul with Michael Jackson? You just too poppy for you? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It just wasn't the kind of music I really liked that much. So, mm -hmm. mm. you know, it was a little, to me, more Michael Jackson into the equation than Paul into the equation. You know, I mean, it, it, they're okay. They're okay. I mean, I don't know. Girl is Mine, I really didn't like very much. Um, and that mm. was on Jackson's side of it. Um, well, say, 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 they wrote say, together. Say, Say, Say was, you know, I don't know. It, it's one of those things that sometimes sounds good and sometimes sounds irritating. But it, it just seems to, <laughs> it just seems to, I, you know, what I've always disliked about some of his trendier collaborations is that it seems to me that he's hopping on to some other style that is really distant from his style and that he doesn't do particularly as well as the other people doing it but kind of just wants to glom onto it and it may be curiosity and he usually gives it up if it doesn't work but to me the, those tracks I mean if I were to if I were to make a playlist of my hundred favorite McCartney songs. I don't think any of those things would be on there. All right. Now, for instance, I, how about the collaboration with Nirvana? How did you feel about that? Yeah, I like that. I like that because I like that kind of, you know, I mean, to me, they are a rock band in the same tradition from which McCartney comes, you mm. know, and I know that, you know, these days, I mean, I don't know, maybe not among our listeners particularly, but, you know, out there in the world of young um, pop listeners, you know, you, you can, you get called a rockist for, you know, saying things like this. But, you know, when uh, a few years ago on the Grammys, when um, Dave Grohl accepted an award and said, uh, 
you know, well, yeah, this was a record that was made on a tape recorder with amplifiers. And you know, it was yes. almost, a, almost a Harrisonian <laughs> kind of comment. You know? right. and, and I tweeted that and said, you know, yes, exactly. And there were all kinds of tweet responses saying, you know, oh, well, this guy's a rockist, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. I can take it. I'm a rockist, you know. And so, yeah, so I like the things he did with Nirvana because, you know, it's a different kind of sound. But it's basically, it's basically the stuff that Paul does really well mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, that's a good point. No, I would love – see, to me, he brings out the Helter Skelter in him. He brings mm -hmm. out, uh, you know, the Monkberry Moon Delights in him. You yeah. know, that voice, that, that right. great rock voice. At the same time, I know a lot of fans don't care for the dance tracks that Paul does, but I think mm -hmm. he does that kind of well. So I did like Say, Say, Say when that came out, or I like the dance version of No More Lonely Nights, which I really liked a lot. So, um, you know, maybe he didn't do it as well as Michael. I don't know. Did you like Michael's music in general, Alan? Not really. Not particularly. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's like, you know, there's a, a lot of people, you know, who are, you know, Michael and, and Kanye as well now. You know, Kanye, as everyone is saying, is like the genius of the time. And I mean, I, I listen to his stuff. I try and see how it works, what it does. I see some interesting ideas in there. But I mean, I just don't see the genius of the time thing. And I didn't yeah. see it for Michael Jackson either. You know, mm -hmm. to me, these guys were like several drawers below you know, the Beatles together or solo, you know, I mean, there's several drawers below Ringo. I don't mean, I don't mean to sound mean about Ringo, but. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> interesting. All right. Very interesting. <laughs> and last but not least, why don't we hear from Mr. Marinucci? You mean it's my turn now? I really? think it's your turn. <laughs> hey, sometimes you go first. I know, that's true. Well, actually, uh, I've been sitting here writing down some ideas while you guys have been chattering uh -oh. away. And, and I, I did come up some, I think I'm going to out Cozen, Mr. Cozen. Oh, boy. Okay. Oh, boy. Um, let's see. I'll start, I'll, I'll do this um, kind of uh, stylistically. Um, basically, all right, first of all, um, I put down a bunch of um, – Old rockers, Little Richard, of course. Fats Domino would be another. Mm. Jerry, Jerry Lee Lewis would be another. Um, Roy Orbison would have been interesting mm. to see the, the and uh, to see the two of them work together. And then I got uh, into uh, British Invasion stuff. Um, I thought of uh, Elton John, of course. Um, the Who. Can you imagine Paul McCartney singing with the Who mm. in their in their heyday? Yes, singing with the Rolling Stones in their heyday. Uh, that would have been doing, you know, I mean, doing his, mm. you know, real rock rock voice. I, that that might be a little harder to think of, but I think that would have been that. There's something to to think about. And then getting a little more modern, uh, Paul McCartney and Prince. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm. That that's another interesting thing. See, that, um, I, that I could see because Prince is also in that rock tradition. I think mm -hmm. Paul said he wanted to work with him. Okay, um, and then I went back. I went back a, a little bit. Um, Paul McCartney and Frank Sinatra. He did write "Suicide" for Frank Sinatra, <laughs> but I would have liked to have seen the two of them together. I also thought of a couple of uh, Denny L doing more with Denny Lane again. I would love to see them work together again. It probably will never happen, but that would be kind of cool. Another person would be um, Emmett Rhodes. Um, I've heard the new album. It does not sound very McCartney-ish as much as the old ones did, but that would be kind of interesting to see what they would do. And then I got a little crazy. We mentioned Aki Takahashi in the Beatle cover show. That would be, that would be interesting. Paul Horn. Can you imagine, uh, Alan, can you imagine him and Paul Horn working together? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. Um, maybe uh, John. Elaborate. Elaborate on that. Paul yeah. had, Paul Horn did a series of albums where he played a flute inside buildings. One of the ones he did was taught, what is called Inside. If you're into um, new age music, check out Inside. It's one of the best new age albums there is. He he played a flute inside the Taj Mahal. And if, if that sounds weird, I mean, just the idea of playing this kind of New Ages flute or doing this kind of stuff with McCartney was interesting. What would McCartney be doing? 
probably vocalizing, I would think, doing, uh, I mean, we don't know what, what Carnival of Light would have sounded like, but I can just imagine him doing, maybe doing some kind of, uh, kind of Yoko kind of noise, uh, you know, kind of that kind of vocalizing type of stuff. Um, I know a lot of people are probably cringing now going, what the hell is he talking about? But I, I can just see Paul experimenting. I mean, we do know Paul did 20th century, I mean, uh, avant-garde stuff. I mean, there's there are a couple of books out there about that. So, and and like I said, he did do Carnival of Light. And I also even, I even put down, although I can't imagine how it would work, John Cage. And then a, uh, two other things hit me. Everybody, everybody has already has always been very critical of the Kanye West collaborations, but he really didn't do much in those. I wonder what it would be like if he actually did something in a in a kind of a rap collaboration, not necessarily with Kanye West, but with somebody that he really had to do something with. And then finally, I've been listening to Yes I'm a Witch too, Yoko's new album. And I'm wondering what would it be like if Paul had worked with various people and remade some of his songs into dance mixes. Um, the new album has all sorts of different people. Sparks is one of them, but that's the really the least of. Uh, I, I mean, Spar- Sparks is really the one of the most accessible of all the people that she works with on Yes I'm a Witch too. But what if Paul had, had remade uh, his his older songs? with uh, modern uh, artists like that. How would people like that? It would be, I mean, it'd be a, a very interesting, it'd be very, it's really stretching the, uh, stretching his art mm. quite a bit. And it would be an interesting uh, thought. I mean, Yoko's been doing it for a while now. Yeah. And the dance mixes have been very popular. I'm not saying to necessarily do dance mixes, although that's probably what would end up, but it would be interesting to see if he would do something like that rather than go down the road with kisses on the bottom. Like he did, you know, doing older songs like that. What if he took his old songs and remade them again? I don't know. Well, that's an inter- I, go ahead. I suppose some people could say that he's been doing that for quite some time anyway with the, I guess, the, the youth uh, remixes that, that are played over the, mm. you know, the PA prior to his mm. concerts. Mm. Yeah, uh, so, that, that, actually, that's a good point. So this I would mean, be kind of an extension, an extension of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if he, yeah, if he actually made an album put them out on an album yeah you're no that's a good point i'm i didn't even think about that but yeah i i I mean how would those come across if he put those out commercially interesting i like Um, that idea i never thought about that i don't know paul is so busy between touring recording mm -hmm. new music remastering his catalog you Mm -hmm. know um i don't know if he'd he'd have time for that and he would definitely get very involved in it hmm yeah, I, I, you're right. I don't know that he would actually let somebody do it. Although Yoko, I mean, Yoko doesn't do those. Uh, those are all done by other people. So yeah, but she approves know. it. I was going to say, has to at yeah, least do that. Sure. Right. I can't imagine right. Paul just saying, "You guys do what you want to do, and I'll just sign off on it." <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's well. He'd say, no. "You do what you want to do, and if I like it, I'll put it out on the album." You know? Right. Mm. It's possible. Right. Yeah. It's, Never it's, say no with him. He's pretty open-minded to so many right. ideas and and new technology. So I, I mean, I think that, I, I, that actually just hit me in the last you know fifteen twenty minutes. But yeah, I mean, I think that would be. And also, I, I also mentioned Yoko uh, working directly with Yoko again. Uh, I, that's, <laughs> how, that's probably not going to be. That's probably going to be not real popular with uh, any Paul fans out there or uh, or my fellow co-hosts but uh, um, I, I wouldn't would... mind really yeah no. I, I don't I, I I wouldn't mind they did, they did one track person. together that never really right. came out you know, Hiroshima. Hiroshima sky is always blue yeah which really which really wasn't all that you know I mean it, it wasn't all that uh, non-commercial as I recall I haven't heard it in a long time but yeah um, I mean, I, I would love to really see them take off and work together. I mean, that would kind of be, that would kind of be interesting. Uh, there might or, be, maybe, might be an ego, maybe, ego clash. Well, that's true. Maybe him, <laughs> maybe him, yeah. him and Sean then. What if he and Sean work together? Uh, that would be, you know, him and Ghost of, Ghost of, uh, um, 
saber tooth tiger. Yeah, tiger. I, uh, I, 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 I shy away from any of those. You know, having like you know, like having any of the you know the Beatles work with their kids that kind of thing. Yeah. I really. I, I, I mean, I well, don't have, I don't have any of the the ghost albums, but. I mean, I, just the fact that it's not uh, him working with a Beatle kid. It's him working in a kind of a different, you know, in a different area, you know, different musical area. And that's what that's what Sean's doing. I'm not I'm not looking at it as a Beatle kid thing. I mm. certainly I don't think for I, I did not mention James McCartney specifically. I do not want to see him work with James McCartney. Mm. I, I'm not a big fan of James McCartney's stuff, actually. And I don't the new song I've heard. I don't particularly care for it, but. Um, I think that would be, that would be, and now who knows, maybe even Danny, I don't know. It, it, Danny would be a little far afield, I think, for Paul. Hmm. You know, l- let me just say a few things about this, because yeah. Al just said you're not a big fan of a Beatle working with his son, and yet right. in our last show, you yes, mentioned George I know. working I, with Danny. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, and I, I was going to ask the three of you, since nobody ever said John with Julian or John with Sean, or a Paul with James, you know, or Ringo with Zach, you know, why nobody thought of that. If, if we're okay with George and Danny. I would say Ringo and Zach because they did work together actually Uh-oh. on stage. I, and, I mean yeah. it more in the studio, something, you know, uh, a collaboration, maybe as songwriters, as musicians together, working on say an album, as opposed to one song, a one-off thing, something more serious. I would be fine with Ringo and Zach. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. But no one would mention John with Julian or John with Sean. Every I, son is very different in their musical styles. I, I think if John had lived, I think he would have done, definitely done something with Sean, not with Julian. Because of Julian's, um, you know, Julian's uh, pseudo John style. I don't think he, he would have gone that route. I what really, do you mean uh, pseudo John style? Well, the way he, the way he, patterned his music so much after well John. that was well, really that, just for the first album and that was and, and, it, that and was, it's his voice it's what it was yeah. and it was really more phil ramon than anything else that, the, the 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 recent album was the same way the, well, most recent, the uh, songs that he writes you're gonna hear something in his voice first of all that will remind you of john and mm-hmm. melodically he he did tell me because i've interviewed him that he's very much a melody man and i can hear a lot of the melodies that he's that he's singing i could hear john sing julian's music is much more traditional sean on the other hand is all over the place musically he can well, do sean made an album called friendly fire which is very close to being more like John, more beatle more structured, more, you know, more, if you want to call it traditional, going back to a, a 60s sound. The stuff that he does with Ghost of a Sabertooth Tiger is far more contemporary, you know, uh, more um, alternative, if you want to use that for, for the term. And Danny's music is, a lot of it is electronic. You know, I, I couldn't really hear, as much as Danny has tremendous respect for his father and mm-hmm. his peers, I couldn't hear George working on songs that that Danny's doing on with the new number two. Mm. You know, they're all very different in their own way. But I could certainly hear John with with Julian or Sean and certainly Paul with James. James has worked with Paul on a few of the tracks on on uh, Paul's album. And Paul got involved with um, with the me album that James did the last album before this one. I I think you, you probably will see Paul and James work together. They have some similarities there too. I mean, James's music is very melodic and very commercial. Mm-hmm. I, I actually could see George doing something with the new number two. You can. I, I could. Uh, I could. I could see George taking taking that step. I I, I definitely could. Um, it would have been it would have been interesting. I mean, I think George would have probably liked to have it ex- experimented maybe at least once. But I mean, we don't know. We're just we're just kind you of know. speculating here. I'm just saying. I mean, in the complete realm of possibility, do you think George could have could have stretched that and done something with the new number two? Sure, he could have. Hmm. I think so. And I, I think, think Danny could probably write a lot of songs more closer to what his father was doing if he wanted yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Sure. exactly. That's what sure. I'm. That's what I'm thinking is that I think they were. I think perhaps they're they're more. The two of them are more simpatico. 
musically. You know, it's one of the reasons why George trusted Danny and Jeff Lynne with mm-hmm. uh, with his you know the instructions for how the brainwashed album should be should be completed. When obviously he realized that he wasn't going to, <clears throat> shall we say, reach the finish line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I could easily see John with with Julian or Sean, because mm-hmm. given John, given the way that John loved Yoko stuff. And going in that direction, you know, a lot of what Sean's doing is that. So, you know, if you want something that's closer to what John had written as a pop song or a rock song, you can go more with what Julian's written. If you want to go all over the place musically, Mm -hmm. it's closer to what Sean's been doing. So, uh, no, I I can easily see John with with Julian or Sean. I can easily see Paul with James. So, uh, okay. Yeah, but Danny has yet to do something that's more, you know, pop or yes. pop rock. And and also we should point out that Julian and Sean and Danny have all gotten involved with soundtrack music, too. They've been doing film scores, too, and that's a whole other side of their music. Danny did that, did do that cover of For You, Blue. That's remember. true. That's true, yeah. So so he did it, it kind of touch on the... The pop thing a little bit, but I mean, not as a not in a released recording. So. But I mean, something that he would write by himself. Oh, yeah. And, and of course, well, he I... did a great job at George Fest, you know, when he's doing George's songs. So, oh. uh, yeah. Anyway, there we go. Okay, then I guess we better. Uh, that's. Uh... Uh, that, that's a wonderful, uh, <laughs> a wonderful <laughs> cross section musically, of people that uh, that that Paul McCartney could uh, uh, could work with either uh, you know that might uh, might be or possibly in some uh, some other alternate uh, alternate universe, we shall see. And uh, but I think the the clock is definitely not on our side, so I think we're going to have to uh, wrap it up. And first of all, just want to get the uh, get the the uh, contact information from Steve. You can get to us by writing things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Give your ideas or criticisms and uh, or whatever, and um, and also you can uh, tweet us on uh, t- get us on Twitter at uh, uh, things we said fab. We have a, a group page on Facebook. We also have a radio station page on Facebook. But if you're gonna if you're gonna get to the idea, if you want to drop us some suggestions or thoughts, go to the uh, the group page on Facebook. Uh, the things we said today group. And I know Ken has some contests and promotions, uh, one of which uh, involves a, uh, a colleague of Alan's and mine at, uh, at Beetle Fan. Right, that's Kid O'Toole, right. who uh, has written a number of books, most recently one called Songs Who Were Singing, Guided Tours Through the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks, and her newest one is all about the musical and creative side of Michael Jackson. Not about his personal life. It's uh, Michael Jackson FAQ, and I have a contest on my website where you can win both those books signed by Kit. And if you uh, if you check out my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, there'll be another special contest that will involve Kit as well. But you have to go there to find all that all that out. And you can also email me at everylittlething at att.net. Okay, and I believe, uh, Alan, you can be reached at uh, Alan Cozen on Facebook or your your alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. That's right. That's probably the best way to get me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me let me also mm-hmm. add my email, my my personal email address is uh, Beatles Examiner at Gmail dot com, oh. and of course. You can catch me on examiner.com. And you can reach me on Facebook at Al Sussman and on Twitter at A-S-U-S-S-49 uh, and uh, also through Beetlefan, www.beetlefan.com and www.paradingpress.com. Uh, this has been a uh, <laughs> a fascinating couple of uh, couple of shows, absolutely. And uh, I'm not sure if we proved anything, but, uh, <laughs> but we, except that's an interesting thought. Except that we've uh, we have some very varying opinions. 
So for Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen and Steve Marinucci, uh, this is Al Sussman, and thanks for listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. Thank you.